Dear Father, thank you for this last lesson on the Holy Spirit. This may be the last lesson of the quarter, but there's a lot more to know about the Holy Spirit. We thank thee that you have at least exposed us to some of the fundamental truths about the third person of the God and how in, he indwells us and can help us equip the church and help us bear fruit for your honor and glory. As we open the word, give us uh, teachable minds and humble hearts and obedient hands and feet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I, uh, let me just summarize. The Holy Spirit is God, right? Uh, why is the Holy Spirit God? I thought there is only one God. Oh, the, Holy, the Christ is God. The Father is God. How in the world can we have three who are God, and yet there's only one God? That's why it's called the mystery of the Trinity. Let me just repeat what that means. Okay, uh, when, when Eve was taken out of the rib of Adam, you had another human being, right? So Adam was a human being. We, Eve was a human being. How many human beings do you have? You have two human beings. In fact, today we have about 6 billion people in the world. We say there are 6 billion human beings in the world because there's a lot of human beings. But when you read the Bible, there is only one divine being. Indivisible, simple. In other words, there's only one God. There's only one divine being. Now, if in this divine being, we read the Bible and the Bible's testimony is that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Let me translate that. The Father is a divine being, Jesus is a divine being, and the Holy Spirit is a divine being. How in the world can three become one? What's our answer? Did we answer this past two lessons ago? Huh? What, uh, how, how did they become? I always, I always give, what was the analogy I gave you? Infinity plus infinity plus infinity equals what? Infinity. infinity. You don't say one plus one plus one plus one, it's because that's our realm. In the realm of infinity and the realm of eternality and eternity, you add three eternities, you add three eternals, you only have one eternal. There is one eternal essence, one eternal divine essence. And all three persons share that essence. How three persons can share that one essence is a mystery beyond our comprehension. Okay? Um, so let's, let's summarize this. Uh, there are seven propositions in the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity says the Father is God, the Son is God, and thirdly, the Holy Spirit is God. All right? And then the next three propositions says, the Father is not the Son, okay? The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. In other words, even if they share a common essence, a common nature, the divine nature, they are distinct from each other as persons, okay? So you got uh, unity in diversity, so you got the, the, the first three premises. Father is God, Son is God, Holy Spirit is God. Father is not the Son, Son is not the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is not the Father. You're sick. What's the seventh premise? There's one God. That makes it mysterious. Because despite the fact that we're talking about three who is God and three that is distinct from each other, the Bible still claims, what does the Shema say? Behold, I am God. No one is, no, there's no other God than me. There's only one God. How can three persons become one? It's the mystery of the Trinity. Again, if you don't understand that. Uh, and then let's review exactly what this means. Uh, and then we will go to the lesson. How, did, uh, how is the Son introduced in the Bible? The Son is introduced as the only begotten of the Father. Right? What's the meaning of begotten? The word used in begotten in the, the favorite text of some of our friends who are what we call neo -rest restorationists is the word in Proverbs 8, 24 and 25. Okay? Remember, wisdom was, was given birth. Uh, the, the word in Hebrew talks about birth pains. You know how somebody goes into labor to, to, act, to, to bear a child? And they're the saying that somehow Paul calls Jesus wisdom, and what the father did was he gave birth to the son. Okay? And because the father gave birth to the son, who came first? Oh, really? <laughs> if, he, if he came from the father, uh, where was the father when there was still no son? 
Oh, he's still there, but he's not father. Oh, so the father has the beginning. You got problems because the Bible calls him an everlasting father. An everlasting father does not have any beginning. Okay, so what does that mean then? Here's the point. When was Jesus begotten? He was begotten in eternity. Are you following? So when the Bible says the father begat the son or gave birth to the son, it happened in eternity, before time. Are you following? Because it, it is before time. You cannot use expressions such as before or after. So you can say the son came from the father. Okay? The son came from, not after. Are you following? Big difference. Big difference between coming from and coming after. Example, the, the Cappadocian, uh, Cappadocian brothers, after the Nicene Creed, were the, were the most precise in describing this. They said, look at the fire, okay? Or a candle. A candle has a flame. Does light come from the candle? Yes, okay? So you can say, light is coming from the fire. What came first, the fire or the light? You cannot separate them by time because those are essential. Without the fire, there will be no light, okay? So in other words, this is the same thing. It is not a chronological generation or birthing. It was an essential birthing. What does the Bible say? The father and the son were so close, it is the same intimacy of a mother to a baby. What is the strongest love in the, in the world? Read Isaiah. Isaiah says, can a mother forget her suckling child, right? In other words, the strongest the, the strongest picture of men's love for each other is the love of a mother for a child. The same word picture is used by God to describe the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. What does that mean? Since time eternity, it's since time immemorial, God and the Son had a very intimate relationship. That's why there was a term that we used before. I don't know if you remember. It's called perichorosis. Choresis. This perichorosis is how the persons of the Godhead interact with each other. How the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, I cannot draw this, but it, it's, like a, it's like a clover. It, it, it's a flower. But uh, one, say, one, one nice translation of this, it's just like a dance. It's almost like the three persons were dancing intimately with each other. They're moving, you know, and you cannot move them away from each other because they're one. Okay. Uh, one other illustration is, I don't know if you guys read music, okay? So this is music. The C chord has C, E, and G. This is what you call a C chord. Okay. You got the note C, you got the note E, and you know you got the note G. You can invert the code, it can be E, G, C, okay, G, C, E. But it's the same C chord, okay? Anywhere you go, it's a C chord, okay? Composed of C, E, G. Let's not go in there anymore, but it, this is probably one of the best explanations. There's a mystery. Uh, wherever you go, it's just still the C chord. Even if you make it an inversion of E, G, C, Okay, that's still a C chord. But why is it called the C chord? It is called the C chord because this is the source of all the notes in the C chord. Okay, in the same token, who is the source of all of the persons in the Trinity? The source is the Father. Okay, why is it the source? Because through the Father, the Son was born. And through the Son, the Spirit was sent. Okay, that's why this is what we call, in this particular case, this was done by uh, begetting. Uh, another term for that is filiation. And this, the Father, the Son sent the Holy Spirit. He proceeded from the Holy Spirit. That's why it's called procession. Okay? It, it was both the Father and the Son that sent the Holy Spirit. Okay. Although the Son came from both the Father, that doesn't mean the Father in exist, existed before the Son, near the Son existed before the Holy Spirit. All that it is saying, essentially, from the Father came from the Son. You know, it's almost like the light and the flame, okay? It's the same thing, the same essence, and the same also with the Holy Spirit. That's where we go. When we go to John 16, verse 7 and 8. Somebody read John 16, 7 and 8. And of 
righteousness and of judgment. All right. Okay. So, what did Jesus say? Unless I go to the Father, the Spirit cannot come. Okay, and, and, and you read, there are, there are four, three chapters in the book of John that emphasize the Holy Spirit. One is John, John 14, and then some in John 15, and mostly in John 16. How is the Holy Spirit called in John? How does, uh, the Holy Spirit called, uh, how does John call the Holy Spirit? He calls the, it's comforter. What's the better What's the better translation? Remember, we talked about this. He called the Holy Spirit a para, parakletos. From two words, para and kletos, kaleo, which is a called, called, and para is beside. This person is called to be beside you. That's why a good translation of parakletos is an ad, an advocate. Right? It's a lawyer, a mediator, an attorney. Okay? And when Jesus said, I will send you another parakletos. You remember we talked about this? And we read in 1 John, who is our parakletos? Who is our advocate? Who is our mediator? Jesus is. Right? Jesus mediates for us. And when Jesus said, I need to go up to heaven because if I do not go to heaven, I cannot send the Holy Spirit. I cannot send another parakletos. What did he use uh, as, as a Greek word? Remember the time that he used? He used alos as opposed to heteros. Basically saying, alos parakletos, not heteros parakletos. Heteros is, is of a different kind. That's why when you say heterosexual, a male and a female, okay, a, a human being of a different kind, they marry to be one flesh. They're heterosexual. Now, when you say alos, it's so similar to homo. Uh, homo is the same. It is another of the same kind. Basically, Jesus is saying, if I do not go, you will not have an advocate of the same kind as me. Let me rephrase that. The same essence, the same nature. So God, Jesus is saying, because I am God and I'm going to heaven, I will send you another advocate who is also God like me. Uh, one of the proofs that the Holy Spirit is God. And more than that, remember we read in Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira, what did Peter say? You did not lie. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? You did not lie to men, you lied to God. Very clearly the apostles called the Holy Spirit as God. Why is the Holy Spirit not just a spirit, not just a, uh, not a gooey there, you know, or something like there is no person? No. Why? Because what did we study uh, today? What is our lesson? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You cannot grieve an impersonal thing. You can only grieve a person. That's why the Holy Spirit is a person. All right? Now that we got that out of the way, the lesson for this coming Sabbath is about what? The work of the Holy Spirit. And since we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, we will go into these three basic outlines. There's only three works of the Holy Spirit. But prior to that, I'd like you to look at, the, look at this. Okay. Uh, the Godhead was active in creation. Okay, what was going on in creation? There's a good outline. These are verses here. We don't have to read it. Who designed the creation? The planner. It was God the Father who designed creation. Okay? Who built? Who was the builder? It's the Son was the builder. And who was the artist? The Spirit moved upon the waters. The artist was... The Holy Spirit. So they were interacting together even in creation. The good news is related to our study. It's the bottom outline. Did they interact in the plan of redemption? They did. Okay. What is attributed to the Father? These are three Ps in order for you to easily remember. I, don't use, I won't use the theological terms. I will use a, uh, not an acronym, but uh, alliteration. The Father is the planner. He planned our salvation. Uh, about the Son. The Son purchased our salvation. And the Holy Spirit personalizes our salvation. Okay? Therefore, you got three Ps. The Father planned. The Son purchased the salvation. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit personalizes the, Holy, uh, the salvation of man. What does this mean in terms of uh, theology? Let me just give it to you so that you, you remember the three pieces. It's easy to remember. It is the Father who elects. 
It is the Father who chooses us to be saved. Okay? It's the Father who calls us. Okay? It is the Son who sacrifices Himself. He gives Himself as a sacrifice so that we can be forgiven of our sins. Okay? And it is the Holy Spirit who applies what Jesus did in our heart so that we can believe what Jesus did. So that's why we say, what, what is the benediction in is that 1 Corinthians 13, 14? Can somebody read that? Yeah. But the Holy Spirit is the one who saved our redemption. Mm -hmm. That's why when I was encouraged, I know this long before, that the Father is the architect, it's like a blueprint. In the blueprint, it must be a seal. And then here, the, blue, the blueprint, the architect is the Father, then the Son is the, blue, the builder. Then that blueprint, observation, is skill because in the blueprint in the, the government if there is no sin it is not approved so here the, the holy spirit approved yes and and, and 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 we, we will we will go there when we go to the work of the holy spirit here okay somebody read second corinthians 13 14 first okay. this is a benediction of, a, of a, it's an apostolic benediction how does it go uh, what is it, second corinthians 13 14 Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. What's the benediction? What's the apostolic benediction? What comes from the Father? Love. Grace. What comes from the Son? Grace. Grace. What comes from the Holy Spirit? Communion and fellowship. We're basically saying it was the love of God for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son who graciously laid down his life. Why is it grace? Because we cannot earn it. It is given to us for free because he died for us. He gave his sacrifice as a free gift to us. And what about fellowship and communion? The Holy Spirit enables us to commune or to start a relationship with God. Okay? So whereas God designed salvation, Jesus executed and achieved salvation, the Holy Spirit applies the salvation that the Father designed and accomplished for the Son. All right? How do, how do you apply the memory verse this morning mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit is sealed up to us? I promise you, Larry, it will come out here. Okay? Okay. There, there's three parts here, and it will, it will come out here. Okay, let's... When was the Holy Spirit sent? Can you remember the text? Acts 2. Go to Acts 2. Uh, I had you read this before. I think it's 24. Yeah, who, who received that? Who received the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's somewhere in 24. And let's see. There is an... Think somewhere in 30, if I don't mean. All right, let's let's begin with uh, verse 32. This Jesus God raised up, and that we all are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the. Okay, follow me. What is the sequence here? Jesus was exalted in heaven. And after his exaltation, what happened? Look at the verse, verse 33. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Ghost here. Yes, uh, uh, Cleo's reading it silently. <laughs> what, the, what does it say? Verse 33. Having what? Having received Jesus. Oh, so who received the Holy Spirit in Acts 2? Jesus. See, people miss this. The, the, the apostles, the disciples also received the Holy Spirit. But who was the first one who received the Holy Spirit? Jesus, Jesus received the Holy Spirit. So follow me carefully in the diagram. Jesus dies okay, and rises from the grave, right? After he, he rose from the grave, 
He cannot give His salvation to those who will believe in Him unless He first goes up to the Father and say, Mission accomplished. Right? He goes to the Father so that He can be exalted. He goes to the Father, Father, mission accomplished. It is done. The salvation of men is given. How does the Father respond? Giving Him authority. Okay, but look at the text. What does the text say? It's, uh, what does it say? All right, okay, this is what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer Larry's question now. There you go. So he goes, Father, mission accomplished. And the Father says, I accept your sacrifice. You can save, you can, you have saved mankind. What did the Father do next? He gave Jesus the Holy Spirit. And what did Jesus in turn do? He grabbed the gift of the Holy Spirit that he had and sent the Holy Spirit to Pentecost. Are you following? So this is the question of Larry. How in the world is the Spirit the seal of God? It is the seal of God because it is the stamp of approval of God. How, how, did, the, how did God put the stamp of approval? Because when Jesus was exalted, the thing that the Father did was to give Jesus the Holy Spirit. Why was, what was the Father trying to say? Now that you have accomplished salvation, I will apply that salvation to the hearts of men who will believe in you. How will I do that? I will send the Holy Spirit to create faith in the hearts of men. That's why you are sealed unto the day of the redemption through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes you believe. Okay? I saw, I saw uh, Terry uh, peeking through his eyes there. Okay? You do not create faith in your heart. The Holy Spirit creates faith in your heart. Okay? You cannot create faith. Yes, uh, Derek. I be wrong with what you just said about the approval thing. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the whole way you get that concept from this, this verse. Uh, it's not all there. If you read Revelation, there was a coronation of Christ in Revelation 4 and 5. Remember, the, who is worthy to open the scroll? I couldn't yeah. find no one who opened the scrolls. And then all of a sudden, he sees a lamb like slain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sitting, the, the throne in heaven is like a couch. It's not just a throne. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father. He was co-ruler of the Father, okay? And who, who is this? And, and he was given the scroll. What happened? Because if you go to the Old Testament, whenever a king is anointed or installed, there are two things that happen. He is given the crown. To be king of Israel is also given the scroll because he will be the keeper of the word of God for the children of Israel. That's why it's a reflection in the, in, in the, in the, New, in the New Testament, particularly in Revelation. And when Jesus went up, he was crowned as king because the, the 24 elders started bowing down and worshiping him, right? He now became the king. The kingdom was given to him. But on top of that, he was given the scroll. Why was he given the scroll? Because he was entrusted the word of God. Yeah, that's why the anointing, the anointing, that's why you say the, 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 the role of Christ is prophet, priest, and king. Okay, he, he is not just the priest. He became prophet, he, he became king. But during the coronation, which is the word picture in Revelation 4 and 5. Remember, in Revelation 4, why were the entire creation worshiping God? Because he was creator, right? Because he created all, all things. The 24 elders and the angels were bowing. And then this lamb, it was slain appears and he receives the scroll and all of a sudden the 24 elders bows down and worship the lamb why are they worshiping now because he was slain are you following there were two motivations for worship in revelation 4 and 5 the first motivation was because god created everything because he's creator you must worship him when the lamb was introduced there was a different motivation for worship what was the or not the different but an additional motivation what was the additional motivation because he was slain he was sacrificed so that's an indirect answer to your question Terry it's saying that because the lamb was slain you in other words it's a word picture of Christ dying for our sins and rising up to heaven all creation worships him now so he was exalted in other words uh, could he have been exalted here on earth no, the plan of God was for him to go back to heaven so he'll be exalted and the Holy Spirit will be given. Actually, when the Spirit was given, this is really neat. 
What is the work of the Holy Spirit? If you read, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will not speak on Him also. What will He do, Jesus Christ? He will glorify Jesus. Okay? So you see this. I'll, I'll get the green. Here's Jesus Christ. Here's, here's, the, here's the cross. Here is the resurrection. So Jesus goes up to heaven. Okay? Uh, and he, now, he is now a priest in heaven. And what happened after Jesus went to heaven? He sent the, he spent the Holy Spirit. What is going on in now? On earth, he is glorified, right? Who glorifies Jesus on earth? He is glorified by the Holy Spirit. In heaven, what happens? The Father exalts the Son. This is still the Trinity. Okay. So he accepts the Son, he exalts the Son. The reason why he exalted the Son was he accepted what the Son did. Because, he, remember Philippians 2, who, who he was in the form of God, did not think it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself to a servant. And then, he, then Paul goes in the end, above, nay, you know, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is exaltation. Why did God the Father exalt the Son? Because he accepted the sacrifice. Why is the whole creation worshiping the Son? Because the sacrifice was accepted. Here's the point. Not that the sacrifice is accepted by God. That salvation must be applied to anyone who will believe. What will make that happen? It will be the Holy Spirit that the Son sends to make that happen. And you know what happens? Uh, God says, I have a seal. Right? What is the seal? That's a question, Adrian. What guarantees that these people will be saved? It is not a physical seal. It is the Holy Spirit that will guarantee that you will be saved. I know there will be another question later here. But the point is, what happens to you when you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes, actually, Terry, when you believe in Jesus Christ, what happened? Where did the Holy Spirit go? You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, then let me repeat the question. When you re re receive Jesus Christ, what happened to the Holy Spirit in you? Oh, yeah, you read in Galatians. Tell me this one thing. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the hearing of faith or by the deeds of the law? In other words, by the hearing of faith, you will receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, as soon as you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. It is not the physical seal, but the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And because the Holy Spirit is present in your heart, oh boy, I'll have to ask this question. Now. Can you be lost? <laughs> uh, if you have the seal, can you be lost? No. All right. So we'll, go, we'll go back to that in our discussion last week. As long as you abide with the aim. See, the, the answer of Larry is no. As long as. <laughs> as long. No, because it, can you be lost? No. Okay. So but you weren't. But we don't have that one save all we say. That is why it's <laughs> you're, you're sounding like my friend, Larry. You're saying, uh, can you be lost? No. no. But we're not saved. If you cannot be lost, then you're saved. Right? But the Holy Spirit <laughs> saved you after redemption. All right. So, Remember our study last week? There are three stages of apostasy. What are the three stages of apostasy? You become a prodigal first, and then you become an apostate, and then you become a reprobate. Reprobate is the close of probation. You have nowhere else to go. You are doomed. You will die. Apostate is in the middle ground. There is still a possibility for you to go back to God. Okay? But you're very close to reprobation. Okay? About the prodigal. Uh, this was a question we had in class this morning. Uh, I know you guys have kids. How many of you have experienced your kids rebelling against you? All right. Okay. Okay, he's the Pope Catholic, that's a question, okay. How many times should your kid rebel against you until you let them go? But you still love them. You still, I mean, even though you let them go, you're still the heavenly father. And you're okay, still okay, let, let me rephrase the question. That's the wrong question. Let me rephrase the question. How many times will your kid rebel against you until he ceases to be your kid? Me, you see, I mean, it doesn't, there is no number until your child. Never. 
Regardless of what happened, he remains your child. That's why that's the beauty of the goodness of the prodigal. Even if you go to the pigs and wallow in the mud with the pigs, God will do everything to take you back. Uh, and I'm going out on the limb. And so a lot, of, a lot of parents come to me here. I go to other churches and I preach in other churches and conventions and conferences. And these parents come to me. In fact, there was a pastor who came to me. He said, being a close friend of mine, he goes, I'm sorry to say that my son does not believe in God anymore. This is an Adventist pastor. Okay? Uh, if that son of his believed in God once, that means this son is only backsliding. Are you following me? And if I believe the story of Jesus Christ, God will do everything for that prodigal to come back. And then we went to the most, one of the most controversial questions we had last week. Sometimes God allows premature death to happen just to take the prodigal back. So what was the question we had? Can somebody who committed suicide be saved? So Larry, Larry, Larry's smiling. When I was taking pastoral theology in college, that was one of the first questions of the, our, our professor. He said, this semester, You'll be given a church. You'll be assigned to a church. So you will know the functions of a pastor will be part of the board, okay? And all these things. You will be asked to conduct funerals. And then he looks at me and asks me, how do you conduct a funeral for one who committed suicide? <laughs> In the other scenarios, why do you have to ask me that? Can a person who committed suicide be saved? I'm a clear, yeah. Okay, so we don't have Benji here. Benji will here give you the scientific action, the answer. Benji will tell you somebody can have faith in Jesus Christ, but because of he goes into drugs and drugs plays around with his brain, there's so much abnormality in his brain, he cannot even figure out what he's thinking anymore. But that doesn't mean that God will reject him as a son, as a child. No, he will still be there and God will probably take him. Well, that is the problem. What is the problem, Adrian? Sure. Uh, how, how's that different from lying, Adrian? Well, no, it's not different. All right. But I'm saying it's okay. yeah. something which is... Sure. I mean, in, a, in, other words, in other words, if you, if you, were, if you were sinning tomorrow and you, you, had, you go into a car accident and you die, does that mean you won't go to heaven? If you say you won't, you believe in perfectionism. <laughs> I, I love to take a camera and take the expressions on your faces. This is the problem. When you think that you are saved because of what you do, this is what we call perfectionism and legalism. If you think I get to heaven because of, of my good deeds, you will have a problem with that question. But if you understand that if you are saved only by the blood of Jesus and nothing of your own, I have no problem to say that somebody who believed in Jesus once and, and somehow messed up his life and backslided and the devil destroyed the body to a, to a point where you cannot recognize the body anymore. Does the father still love that body? You can get pushed and pushed and pushed in your life and then sure. all of a sudden you can smack Sure. Sure. Now, now there's another scenario. <laughs> okay. I don't know. That, that's some conditions of returning to, to, to God. Like what? You know, if you sin and you didn't Okay. That's what the Bible says. Okay, so you woke up the following day, Adrian, you had a heavy problem. But you believe in Jesus. You know that Jesus is your Savior. You're related to Him. Your relationship is strained because you have so, so big of a problem. There's, there's so much tension. You did not pray enough. And you had a car accident. And you died in the car accident. That, that's, that's the meaning of the auto hell? Exactly. If you're thinking that, if if you're thinking that you will go to hell because of what you do, you will have a problem. And if you think you're gonna go to heaven because of what you do, that will still be a problem to you. But if you know you'll go to heaven because of Jesus Christ, and that's, an amen on that. and that's why it's very difficult for people who are legalists and perfectionists to understand that even if somebody has gone senile. When I say senile, get to second childhood, doesn't understand this. So foul mouth, still a child of God. Okay, now there's another scenario. 
There are people in church who are cultural and congregational Christians. You know what a cultural Christian and congregational Christian is, right? Remember last week? You're a cultural Christian because, hey, are you an Adventist? Well, I was born in an Adventist family, and I live in an Adventist community. So I, am go, I go to church because my family is Adventist, my community is Adventist. That's a cultural Adventist. That's a cultural Christian. Does that mean he believes in Jesus? No, he just goes with the culture. There is another term called congregational Christian. We talked about this last week. What is a congregational Christian? Oh, because our congregation is Adventist, I guess I'm an Adventist. These are what we call nominal Christian. Why is it nominal? Clear, remember, where does nominal come from? Nomos, name. They're Christians in name only. Are there Christians in the church who are Christians in name only? You might think they're backsliding, but what does John say? They were never with us. Are you following me? They were never saved. They never became convictional Christians. This is my contention. If somebody accepts Jesus truly, okay, and is saved by Jesus Christ and is a convictional Christian, even if he backslides, God's going to go after him and take him back. But isn't that part of the problem that once saved, if he's saved, always saved, and part of the problem is that it's a big problem in the church. That's how people look at it. Yeah. I might walk away from the church and everybody say, mm. he was never saved. I tell you what the biggest problem with once saved, always saved is. People use the concept of once saved, always saved. Hey, once I'm saved, I can do anything I want. That's, that's, that's the equation of once saved, always saved. And a lot of people going around teaching that, hey, because I'm saved by grace, I can do, I can sin as much as I want. But if you read Paul, that's the opposite. If you understand grace, you will hate sin. Yeah. And if you do not hate sin, what does it say? You are not saved. See, people don't get this. If you hate sin, that means you have, you have already fallen in love with God. You have been saved. Can you backslide? You, you won't sin anymore, Larry? After you... Okay, what happens when you sin? You actually backslide, right? You backslide. You, then you pick up yourself. Then you, you, deny, well, you have to come back. And, but, where you, but if you hate hated sin and... Sin convicts you. What happens? You go back to the Father. You never say, I'm no longer a son. I'm saying, I'm going to go back to my Father because I'm still the son of the Father and the Father can take me. You know that part of my prayer which I prepared last night? Remember that part of my prayer when I said, even in our fiercest struggle, our biggest problem, in our worst sin, you are there. And all we need to do is throw ourselves at your grace and mercy and you will take us back. That's a very powerful good news. And people want great because what you know people will tell you, try to be good. You know, remedy your sin and you will be saved. That is not the solution of the Bible. The solution of the Bible is, is go back to the Father. What does the Father say? You take a bath. You clean up yourself. I cannot receive you that way. You stink. The Father did not say that. What did the Father? Oh, hush, hush. You don't even have to memorize what you memorize coming here. Give him the ring. Give him the sandals. Give him the robe. Come back. My son who was dead is now alive. That's how eager God wants you to take, take you back if you backslide from him. And I believe if you accept Jesus and you begin to love God more than you love the world. You are saved. You backslide. God will do everything to take you back. Wouldn't if I had an attitude like that, like, well, I was baptized, I was saved, or this or that, and went out and just sinned every day, and <coughs> wouldn't it be kind of a, a clue to myself saying, here, is there something wrong? That's why Peter says, make your election sure. Oh, I'm part of the cult. I'm a cult. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm part of the cult people of God. I am part of the elect. Even the very elect will be deceived. I'm part of the elect. I'm part of this remnant in the end. But what does Peter say? Make your election sure. How do you make your election sure? Does that mean you got to be perfect? No. What he says is, do you hate sin? That's and we're going to there. That's do you hate sin? There is a problem if you sin and you do not hate sin. That is only proof that you were not saved. It's very, and really, it's not how good a person is. The person is, how much does he hate sin? Because look at, what's the difference between Judas and Peter? Two case studies. That's why, very soon, very soon, we may hear, do you love me more than this? Yes, okay, but, but Larry, what's the difference between Peter and Judas? Judas repented too. He was just trying to provoke Jesus to use his yes. power. But then he yeah. didn't. So he kind of was disappointed with the result. 
It's a clear, it's a deep theologian, you know. <laughs> Judas repented before the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. He did not repent before God. Okay. That's why Cleo is saying he repented because his plans did not materialize. He had the grand, grand scheme to incite Jesus, to provoke Jesus, to fight the Romans because, you know, Jesus will never lose. And it didn't work. And he was sad, not because he just betrayed Jesus. He was sad because all of his plot did not come into fruition. It was not successful. All of his plan didn't work. He was never safe. Peter, though, how bad was Peter when he denied Jesus Christ? If it were recorded today, you will have four expletive words. He was cursing left and right. So, bleep, 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 don't bleep, bleep that name, that man. I bleep, bleep, bleep. How much worse can you be? That's probably the worst thing you can do. That's, that's worse than drug addiction. That's worse than adultery. To deny Jesus to his face is the worst thing that you can ever do. But what happened to Peter? He went out and he cried. Why did he cry again? Because he hated what he did. Here's the point. The difference between a saved and an unsaved person is somebody who sins and backslides will hate what he does. The unsaved person will not. He will keep on sinning until he becomes a reprobate. You know why the prodigal went back? He began hating the pigs and what the pigs ate again. And he realized how miry and how dirty the pigs were. And what did he say? <laughs> Think of home. Look at the servants of my dad. They can at least have three meals a day. They can take a shower, they can take a bath, and look at me here, I'm wallowing with the pigs. He started hating what he had and went back to the Father. So, but again, my caveat last week, we don't know who is a prodigal and who is an apostate and a reprobate. Only God knows that. But I can tell anybody who comes to me straight to their face, if your son accepted Jesus once in his life and was convinced of Jesus Christ, God will do everything to take him back. How he does that, that's why the only prayer is, I always pray this, Lord, don't hurt him too much. Because you read the Bible, we read it in John, right? And we read it in Corinthians. Some people take, take the emblems when they're, not, when they're not fit, they become sick, they even die. If they, if they eat of the Lord's Supper and they're not ready. What did, what did First John say? God allows people to have the sin unto death. What's sin unto death? It's not about the venial and mortal sin. We're talking about people can sin and God will allow you to die the physical death. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care for you. What kind, of, what kind of people did we have in Corinth? Paul called them the saints in Corinth. In other words, they were saved, right? That's why they're saints. But what, what kind of lifestyle did the Corinthians have? There was incest. There's rampant immorality and idolatry in Corinth. And yet Paul called them saints because he knew that they tasted of God. They were saved. But you know what happened to them? They backslided. That's why Paul is being used by God to prod them to come back. Anyways, uh, that goes back. That's a whole long answer to Larry's question. When you are sealed by God through the Holy Spirit, that's a guarantee that you will make it through. But the big question is, like Terry is saying, how sure are you that the Holy Spirit indwells you? And that's how sure are you that you have believed in Jesus Christ. Can you believe? Can you be sure that the Holy Spirit indwells you? How can you be sure? Yeah. Let me give you, let me, and I'll, I'll read you the quotation from Ellen White, okay, in the end when we, we finish this up. He, basically, if you hate what Jesus hates and love what Jesus loves, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Does that mean you do not do things that Jesus hates? Oh my, in your sinful nature, that you battle your inner person like Romans 7? Sometimes you do things you don't want to do. The biggest problem is if you do evil things and you want to do it, there's something wrong with you. You are not saved if that's the case. That is the struggle. If I preach holiness and, and victory over sin, my preaching will not be about perfectionism. My preaching will be about hatred for sin and love for Jesus Christ. That's the criteria. The question in the end is, do you know my son? If you know my son, do you love what he loves? Do you hate what he hates? 
If you, the father will never say, how many things that you did were hateful to Jesus? He will not ask you the question. The question is, do you know my son? Do you love what my son loves? And do you hate what my son hates? If you can say yes, yes, that doesn't mean you don't fall. But you love Jesus Christ and Jesus is first priority in your life. All right. Well, let's go to the summary. It's a long answer, Larry, but that's the, Larry, that's the answer for the guarantee. The fact that the Holy Spirit is in your heart, that is a seal. What does a promise in John 6? He that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. He that the Father gives me, I will not lose. I will not lose whoever the Father gives me. Okay, That's the promise of God. You're given to me and the Holy Spirit is given to you. You are the seal. That's the seal of your redemption in God. All right? So what are, the, what are the three things that the Holy Spirit will do? This is the summary of our lesson. Verse 9, what does it say? God, the Spirit, will convict the world of three things. What will He convict the world of? Firstly, He will convict the world of sin. Yeah, we'll, we'll go there. We will, the sin of righteousness and judgment. But why will He convict the world of sin? There's always a reason for those three. Look at verse 9. John 16, verse 9. All right. Does this say the Spirit will convict, okay? Will convict the world of sin because they did a lot of wicked things? No, because they did not believe. Aha. Uh -huh. Pretty cool. Otherwise, they, they reject. All right. Okay. So, in so far the Holy Spirit and Jesus is concerned, what is sin? Sin is unbelief and mistrust. It is not doing bad things or doing good things. Okay? I'm not saying it has nothing to do with good or bad deeds. Yeah. But I'm saying sin fundamentally is not good or bad deeds. Sin fundamentally is trust or mistrust. Belief or unbelief. That's why my favorite text is Romans 14.23 when it All comes right. to sin. What well, less Romans 14.23? Remember the story in Romans 14.23? People were, were debating each other whether you should eat meat offered to the idols or not, right? We do, do you want to be vegetarian? you want to be meat eater? Okay? It's the gray areas. And then Paul ends the chapter and says, That which is not of faith is sin. Are you following? The definition of Paul for sin is not doing bad things. Or eating food offered to idols or not eating food offered to idols based on your conscience. Paul is saying, in the final analysis, what really matters is, do you have faith in Jesus or do you trust Jesus? If you do something that is mistrusting Jesus, it is sin. You hold on to your horses. I'll really start stepping on toes here. When you worry, is it a sin? Yes. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, lack of yeah, lack of trust. Uh, Matthew 6 is saying, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. You're more important than birds. You're more important than flowers. And how come you distrust me? Yeah, why, why are you stressed out? Question. I'll give you another example. Why in the world don't people attend church once in a while? Oh, because they're busy doing something else. No, that's not the reason. The reason is, oh yeah, because I need to work. Because if I don't work, I will not earn money. What is the problem? The problem is not money. The problem is you, you don't trust God enough that He will take care of your material needs so that you prefer your work over congregating and worshiping Him in church. Are you following? That revolutionizes your concept of sin. That's why the Holy Spirit is so vital. When the Holy Spirit comes to you and convicts you, He will not convict you of your good or bad deeds primarily. Fundamentally, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Heavy. Very straightforward though. Simplifies your life. If you worry too much, you got problems. You're sinning a lot. Why are you sinning a lot? Why are you sinning a lot? What's the answer of the Holy Spirit? Because you do not believe Him. You do not trust Him. You do not have faith in Him. So what do you do? How do you have more faith? Aha! Here comes Romans 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, let's, let's, let's write that. What? Faith comes from what? Hearing. 
and hearing by the word of God. Yeah, 10, 9, 10, 10, 19, 10, 19, uh, uh, 10, uh, here, 10, 17. That, 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 that's, uh, that's the passage I, I use for expository preaching. But here's the point. So if you have little faith, how do you increase your faith? Read the word of God. You, you study the scripture, you attend the service. That's the right answer. The right answer is, the only solution takes the Bible to have more faith is to hear more of the Word. How do you hear more of the Word? You study the Word. You listen to the Word. Before you know it, you begin to develop your faith in God. That's why I do not buy the teaching that, oh, some people just study doctrines and they, they study theology. But me, I just want to know Jesus Christ. Is there anything wrong with that? How can you know Jesus without studying the Bible? Is it possible to know the Bible and not know Jesus Christ? Yes, yes the, whole, the whole children of Israel, the whole Israelite, the Jewish nation memorized the Old Testament, but they rejected the Messiah. But, okay, and that's like in number two and number three. <laughs> if you go back here. It is possible to know the Bible and not know Jesus Christ. But is it possible to know Jesus Christ without knowing the Bible? No. Did you guys get my point? This is, I hope you emphasize that in your class. It is possible to know the Bible and not know Jesus Christ. But it is not possible to know Jesus Christ without knowing the Bible. What is the answer? If I have little faith, how do I increase my faith? I get exposed to the Word of God. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So when, when they told me, oh, Bing, you'll be pastoral prayer during the anniversary celebration. You know that I read my prayer this morning because I spent about an hour last night writing the prayer. What did I do in writing the prayer? I look at passages of scriptures. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. If my people shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will live from heaven and I will heal their land. What was I doing? I was getting the Word of God, putting it in prayer. Because when people hear the Word of God in prayer and look at God, their faith will increase. I, you know, you know I, I felt how the Spirit worked. Every time I was reading the sentence, which I carefully crafted last night, the praise team was saying amen to my right. I, I could hear them. You know, when, I, when I mentioned, I pray, we, do, we persist in begging for a miracle to heal Jolene. Because when, when cancer was ravaging her body, he brought Eli and Ethan to church to worship you. Oh, amen. <laughs> what was I doing? I was applying the word of God in prayer. And the more people hear the word of God applied to their lives, the more faith they will have. Why do you think this guy who wants to work three jobs and miss church and miss prayer and fellowship altogether, why, does he, why, why is he guilty of unbelief? and mistrust because he, th he doesn't think that if he misses out on one of his jobs in order to attend church and serve God in church he will not have enough salary and money to live that's Matthew 633 how does it go seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you how, how that Queen Elizabeth was confronted by one guy one day Queen Elizabeth said ah uh, I want you to take care of something for me. And then this baron tells Queen Elizabeth, I'm sorry, your highness. I am busy doing my job. And you know what Queen Elizabeth said? Go on my errand and I will take care of your job. Do you get it? That's the problem. We think that our job is more important than God. And God is telling us, make me first and I will take care of you. Now you understand why the Bible says that which is not of faith is sin. You talk about adultery and doing bad things. Everything is a mistrust and unbelief. You do not trust God. That's why you do all sorts of things. Why in the world do people go to drugs? Because they don't think God can give them enough joy and fulfillment. They think drugs will give them the fulfillment. Right? Why do they start drinking? Why do they like, pursue pleasure like crazy? Because they don't think that God can give them pleasure beyond imagination. Lack of faith. Lack of faith. And the first work, the first work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin. How does the Holy Spirit convict us of sin? He convicts us of our faith. 
I believe in next time I preach, I this think sometime in April. Kind of, uh, this is the kind of sermon that I did. Yeah, so, but, but I mean, that, that's very encouraging though. You read this thing, when you read this in the Bible, then you say, oh my. You know, I need to listen to the word of God to increase my faith because I cannot create faith on my own. But you know what the promise is? If I expose myself to his word and I pray and talk to him, he will increase my faith. Uh, do you know how powerful the question of Pastor General was this morning? How many of you, he said, have come to a point that if God's not there, everything's going to crumble? How many of you have come to the end of your ropes? That was, his, that was his question, basically, right? What do you do when you come to the end of your ropes? You come to Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, because the Holy Spirit's primary goal is to glorify Jesus Christ. And you know what the Holy Spirit does in your big problem, in your sin? The Holy Spirit tells you, come on, trust Jesus, and you will see his glory. He will come through. Yeah, he, he, Pastor General mentioned a favorite phrase of mine that I haven't used for the longest time. A God moment. Have you, heard, have you heard of the God moment? What's the meaning of a God moment? A God moment is a moment that happens in your life where the presence and the power of God becomes very real. That God moment happens when you have more faith. How do you have more faith? By communing more with His Word. So what do I say? When you got problems in the family, you got problems with your relationship, you got problems in your job, you got all sorts of problems, what's the thing to do? Do you run away from God? No. You go to God, go to His Word, worship Him, and learn more about Him. And faith will come because you have heard His Word. Okay. Uh, and and let, uh, how, how does this reflect on the study of the Holy Spirit? Who inspired the Word of God? It was the Holy Spirit who inspired the holy men of God. Inspiration, remember this? Inspiration was done by the Holy Spirit. And because this is the word of God, can the human mind understand the Bible? No. no. The Holy Spirit needs to help us. And what do we call that? That's illumination. The same Spirit who inspired the word will illuminate our minds, will illumine our minds for us to understand. So that what happens... We find salvation. From inspiration to illumination and salvation, the Holy Spirit works. Right? In Ben Amen, uh -huh. I asked I ask the people in America, mm -hmm. I said, what is the primary function of the Holy Spirit uh, we are studying for the last three months? And naturally, they will tell you those three that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Seeing, conviction, righteousness. I say, yeah. But for me, there is better than that. And I say, what is that? I say, the primary function of the Holy Spirit is to remind me what Christ has done for me 2,000 years ago. Because that is a, I'm, a, I'm not going to heaven for what I did. Mm -hmm. I'm going to heaven for what Christ did for me. So. He will remind me what he did to me mm -hmm. on Calvary. Then on that, I can be convicted of sin, of righteousness, that I might be righteous for Jesus Christ, but for me. Yes, actually, we, we studied earlier in this quarter, what's the primary work of the Holy Spirit? When he comes, he will glorify me. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. How is Jesus glorified? He is glorified through the revelation of the word. Don't forget this. And I'm going to say this again and again. The whole Bible is about the glory of Jesus Christ. Yes, and it points to Jesus. It's about the glory of Jesus Christ. So when you hear the word, it's nothing more than getting exposed to the glory of God. And that's the Holy Spirit's favorite work, to glorify Jesus Christ. And when the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ, what happens? He makes you hear. He gives you an ear to listen. And after he gives you an ear to listen, he will develop and grow your faith. Okay? So that's the first work of the Holy Spirit, is to make you believe. Okay? So that after you're convicting, convicted of your sin, he will make you believe. What's the next work? The next work is righteousness. Why, why righteousness? What does verse 10 say? Why will the Holy Spirit convict the world of righteousness? Because we're doing bad things. Come on, read what the text says. It's right here. 
Yeah. yeah but verse, verse 10 says, it will convict the world of righteousness because why? <laughs> People who have preconceived ideas will not understand it. Because I go to my father. <laughs> I hope you understand what this means. Righteousness is the exaltation of Jesus Christ. You follow me carefully. How are we able to pray today? We pray only in Jesus' name. How are we able to approach the throne of grace? We approach the throne of grace only because in Jesus Christ. How are we able to do that? Because Jesus is, the, is at the right hand of God interceding for us. Only perfect righteousness can be accepted by God. Are you following me? Nobody can come to God short of perfection. If that's the case, can anyone approach the throne of grace? No one. Who alone can approach the throne of grace? He who is perfect. Who is perfect? The lamb slain since the foundation of the world happens to be Jesus Christ. How am I able to boldly approach the throne of grace? Here is Hebrews. Because we have a high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. In other words, I am only righteous before God because Jesus, my Savior, is righteous. Uh, exactly. The bottom line is this is righteousness by faith. And I'd, I'd like to make this diagram again in our study. Remember we studied about what are the three phases of, of, of salvation? We have justification, right? Sanctification and glorification. So this is the justification in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is this. But what we said is at any given point in time, justification must be the umbrella. This is sanctification. This is glorification. All right. Uh, a lot of people who struggle in Christian life and they want to grow in discipleship and grow, grow in grace in Jesus Christ is undergoing sanctification. Question, how is sanctification alone possible? Can you be sanctified by trying to live a holy life? Why? <laughs> who were the holiest people during the time of Jesus? The Pharisees, right? Because they, they did the holy acts. Were they ever really sanctified? No. So they're like, they were like uh, whitewashed sepulchers, right? Rotting bones inside. I like guess they're so good in the externals, they're hypocrites inside, they're, they're bad, okay? Why? Because they tried to seek holiness on their own. I go back to this. Justification is only possible, uh, sanctification is only possible if we keep on going back to justification. What does that mean? Righteousness by faith, says Larry. I am only righteous before God because of what Christ has done for me. What did Christ do for me? Because he died on the cross. When God looks at the cross, he does not see Jesus. He sees me dying for my sins. How much did I pay? How much did Jesus pay? He paid an eternal price. Did I pay the whole price? Yes, I paid it through Jesus Christ. Uh, Ellen White says it. The law says, enough, enough. It has been satisfied to the strictest rigor of justice. The penalty of sin has been paid by Jesus Christ. And then the good news is, when Jesus looks at me, does he see me? He does not see me. What does he see? He sees the righteousness of Jesus covering me. And because the righteousness of Jesus covers me, how does the Father look at, look at me? He looks at me as somebody who is perfect, who is righteous. How am I righteous? Larry already said it. It is righteousness by... That righteousness is never here. That righteousness is up there. And the only way you can have righteousness is to look at Jesus Christ. And I don't have to go through all the text here, but in John 5, 39 and 40, uh, Larry already mentioned that. You search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, but yet you don't want to come to me to have life. In other words, the whole of the Bible points to me. All of the scriptures testify about me. And then you go to Romans and he says, it is a righteousness to which all the scriptures testify. Whose righteousness? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Basically, Jesus is saying, the whole of the Bible is about my righteousness. Righteousness that saves men from his sins. And if you believe in my righteousness, not your righteousness, you know what happens? You will be saved. What am I trying to avoid here? This is what I'm trying to avoid. As Adventists, this has been our perspective. What do we concentrate on today? This is how we preach it. Oh, when you accepted Jesus Christ, you were justified. Now you are being sanctified. So what do you concentrate on? You concentrate on sanctification. Unbeknownst to them, they can never be truly sanctified unless you go back to justification. 
Okay? That's my, that must be fed by the cross. So the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of righteousness. How does the Holy Spirit convict us of righteousness? That the righteousness is in Christ alone, not in us. All right? Lastly, the Holy Spirit will convict us of judgment. Why will the Holy Spirit convict us of judgment? Because what? The prince of this world has been judged. Who is the prince of this world? Satan has been judged. So I was looking at this. This is this. Is this like a doomsday thing? No. Holy Spirit convicts us of sin so that we can grow our faith by dwelling on the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness, telling us that only the righteousness of Jesus will make us fit to stand before God. And therefore, have faith in that righteousness. Hold on to that righteousness. And the Holy Spirit will, will hold on to you. Judgment. Whoa, what about this judgment? All that the Holy Spirit is saying, what did Jesus say? In this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There's another quote that Pastor Ed General mentioned this morning in his sermon. What did he say? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What happened at the cross? Satan was judged, right? I got to review this. Wasn't, when was Satan defeated? Oh, what happened in heaven? Remember, there was a rebellion in heaven. And Michael and his angels went against Lucifer and Satan. And what happened? They drove Satan out of heaven. When did that happen? Haha. <laughs> so, so they're saying, wasn't Satan defeated by Michael in heaven? Cleo. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cleo said, given a chance. <laughs> okay. We'll go back to the study of Job. Okay. When did that happen? It must have happened before the Garden of Eden, right? Because Satan was already in the garden in the person in the impersonating uh, in the snake, snake impersonating, okay? So the fact that the devil was already in the garden, that means he was a, the devil before the Garden of Eden. So if he's the devil before the Garden of Eden, that fall from heaven and the defeat in the hands of Michael must have happened before creation. Can it be at the cross? So what happened at the cross? How did Jesus defeat Satan at the cross. Uh, so, he, he, he was not able to kill Jesus. Jesus laid out his life. Okay. Let, let me cut to the chase. It's already three o'clock. But Doctor Stefanovich answered this question. Remember in Job, he Satan was still allowed to represent the planet Earth because, uh, okay, uh, you know what happened during the council in heaven and at the cross? The chair said, yo, you're not welcome here anymore. <laughs> it's almost like the, the principal and the teacher telling the class, your classmate, it's your class, he's not classmate anymore. He is ex expelled from the school. Are you following? That's a defeat. May not be a physical defeat, but he's not able to come back and be part of God's counsel anymore. In other words, whereas he was defeated, we cannot call it physically, in heaven, he was thrown out physically from heaven, although there's this spirit. At the cross, he was expelled by God from heaven altogether. And more than that, he no longer reigns. And that's what, uh, what uh, uh, Rufo is saying. He is no longer the prince of this world. Why? Because the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. At the cross, this world ceased to be the kingdom of the prince of darkness. At the cross, Jesus became the prince and the king of this world. In that sense, Satan has been defeated. Why, why did I quote that? Because in our lives, we will battle with the devil. We will have a lot of problems. What is the promise? The Holy Spirit will tell you, don't worry because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit will tell you, as big as your problem is, as big as your, your, your trial is right now, the devil causing the trial is already defeated. And in Jesus Christ, you have greater power than the devil. Good news. 
It's the good news is that the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin so you can believe in Jesus some more, give you righteousness. Okay? He'll convict you of righteousness to give you an assurance that if you believe in Jesus, you will stand before the Father, the right hand of God in Jesus. And He will convict you of judgment, not because you are judged, but because the Prince of this world has been judged. And there's no problem so big, no enemy so mighty that He cannot destroy. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Amazing, amazing story. So that, that's the way to cap our lesson. God sends this, this promise, this work of righteousness, of faith, and of judgment. And all of this redounds to the glory of Jesus Christ. And if we dwell on the glory of Jesus Christ, and what, what, how did, how did uh, we, end with, we end with this? How did Pastor Ed earn his sermon this morning? How did the Jehoshaphat army conquer the enemy? They, they worship. And because they worship, they won the victory. How do, why do we worship? The reason why we worship is because the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ. By convicting us of sin, that we might believe. By convicting us of righteousness, that we might stand before the Father, the right hand of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, and by judgment, that we might be assured of our victory over the enemy. All right. Let's bow heads for prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this wonderful way to earn the lesson on the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit. And because of the gift of the Spirit, we can increase our faith through His enablement. We can be assured that we are righteous before the Father because of what Jesus has done. And we can have the assurance that we can have victory over our enemy every day. And in so doing, we can have the promised seal of redemption in the Holy Spirit until Jesus comes back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.